So basically we have a categorization, as I was mentioning, I believe uh, before. So everything starts from here. The, this is how we rank the players in our club. And also this is how we rank the coaches in our club. Uh, this, this is what is helping us to give the contracts, to have the continuity and to make also selection or the scouting. So this is the process that we have in, the, in our academy that, and we separate it in the four phases. The first phase, uh, fund sector, second phase, uh, mid sector from U12 to U15 and from in the phase three is the pro sector or U16 to U19. The last phase or professional football is something that we are preparing them to throughout the academy. And we also have at the moment a B team in the second division that uh, is uh, used as uh, some kind of bridge to get the kids from the junior football to the, to the professional football, which is a huge, huge step. So a team of Hajduk split in order to know like how we build the methodology, you also need to know like what is our environment. So our a team is at the moment like a platform that's, uh, sorry, David, do you, do you see my, uh, yep, my, that is great. No, no, my mouse. Do you see? Yes. When yes. I, yep. We, we yep. see it. Yep. <laughs> so basically at the moment where we are on the market is that we are like a, feed club for the clubs like Bar Leverkusen, Monaco or Benfica who wants to obviously uh, buy a raw talent and uh, give him two, three years in their professional environment and then sell them to the super clubs who don't care about the money but they just care to, uh, to have a players at the peak of their performance. So knowing this, I would say, game uh, we need to know where to position ourselves, and uh, we do have a lot of uh, talented kids. So that's why we that, that's why we also need uh, need to push them as earliest as possible in the professional football in order to 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 give them this like a like a needed experience to go in the leagues like Bundesliga and so on. So knowing this. Uh, we, we, we start giving uh, players a possibility in the first team from 17, 16, 17 years old. Uh, we also need to know that uh, forwards usually reach peak of their performance even sometimes before 27 years old, while goalkeepers and the defenders, they, they can reach that peak of the performance later in, in, uh, in their career. So maybe their peak of performance might be around 29, 30, which means that like when we are putting them in the first team, because this is, these are the positions where like your mistake influence the result a lot. We need to make sure that these play, goalkeepers and defenders are ready for, for, for the pressure of the professional football. So they can even make a debut in the first team when they are 21 or 22. While with the forwards, we're trying to give them a chance already with 17, 18 years old. So it's very important to, to understand the market as well. So when, we, when, we're, looking, uh, when we're looking on the market, uh, basically the whole football world is at the moment uh, located around this area that you see it so around like a London, Paris, a little bit it goes down to Spain and like Italy, especially in the past, but I would say like a British Premier League, a little bit of Spain, German Bundesliga, a little bit of Italian football and then some French teams. It's like what it makes like, a, like a, all the money moving around. So when we know this, we need to know like what what these uh, super clubs and the clubs, what they need in order to have the top, uh, top players in their, in their home. So when we look South America, that's where they're looking players with the very good skills. Uh, when they look uh, like, for example, Africa or like uh, players who, who, who have uh, African descendants, uh, players from like uh, France, uh, Italy, they uh, they are looking for physicality. 
when they look f- like a players from Asia, like a Korea or even Japan, that's like a players with a very good discipline. It's like not very good, but I would say it's a, it's extraordinary discipline. When we when we look like players that are coming from Poland, from Scandinavians, or like from German uh, places, these are the players that are developed in the in the very strict systems. So. Uh, and when we look like uh, Spanish and Portuguese players, this is like a system and the skills together. So what what we need to know, we need to identify what we are giving to the market. And obviously, if we are doing this already pretty good, and I think we are doing it, we have to keep on doing it. So what we identify as a Croatian players that are playing on this top level is that usually they are uh, creative and they have a good skills. This is what the market needs from us. They don't need like physically strong players because we're never going to be as physically capable as there the, there are players coming from from African countries or from like uh, from uh, uh, from this like a uh, fr- French uh, development systems. So knowing this we need to we need to understand also the influence on the players like how the players are uh, influenced uh, on the th- on the three different levels so there in the splits uh, in the splits model by de boucher there are uh, three levels of influence macro level meso level and the micro level so starting from micro level this is like a uh, this is like a family friends uh, girlfriend, uh, individual coach, uh, he, his own head coach of that age group. While meso level is like a, is like a developmental program. So something like this, what I'm going to be presenting to you. So it it differentiates from our club to your club to the third club, and uh, this is something that like can be modified by us. So. Both of these first two levels, it's it's like in the it's in our hands to change it and to influence the players differently. While when we talk about the macro level, this is something that that's like a society and or it's like a country or it's like a politics. That it's something that's out of our hands as a club, as a as a coach or a academy directors that we can actually change it. So it's like a geographical position uh, whether how many sunny days croatia has comparing to usa or like uh, political structure are we uh, democracy or we are uh, i don't know some uh, totalitarian regime and, and stuff like this so when we look on this the science or some scientific papers they say and this is on the olympic sports not only the football they say that uh, micro and meso level so something that's in our control it's influencing the development of the player 50 percent while this macro level that's out of our control it's it's um, it uh, makes an influence of rest of it or an other 50 percent so this is a uh, it's very important to know this when we are discussing when we are discussing about like creating a methodology or creating the plan for developing the players why because i believe we first need to identify this macro level uh uh like um, differences or like i need to analyze croatia and see okay croatia it has this, 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 and this. Okay, then I need to adapt my meso level and micro level in order to create creative, skillful, uh, technical, tactical player as I wish to do it. So throughout this uh, presentation, I'm going to throw a few like uh, maybe comparison. And for me, it's very important that you remember this, uh, this uh, saying. And it says that sometimes a negative trend in society or on this macro level can bring a positive uh, something positive for a football or vice versa something positive in the society can bring a negative for the football development i'll refer to this later so when we talk about geography in croatia we we need to know that croatia has the i believe the most sunny days in europe 
So basically, this is good for a football. If we, we have a sunny day, kids can play outside, and uh, this is giving us for sure advantage comparing to like uh, Scandinavian countries. Uh, when we look at the social mobility, and this is now interesting. So like social mobility in Croatia is really low. Social mobility basically means that like if you are born rich, obviously you most likely you remain rich in your life but if you are born uh, poor it's very hard hard to move uh, yourself up in the state in the in these levels of so society yeah? so this is for example something bad in society or something negative that our uh, like a economical political uh, system is but for football this is good because football is giving a chance to move up in these levels if you are obviously a top talent that can create a professional career. So a lot of kids want to play football, obviously not because of this, but because they want to become a stars. And obviously their parents want that their kids try themselves in football because they might have a better life. So again, something negative in society brings something positive for a football. Now, here is one uh, example of how something positive in the society brings something negative for the football. So uh, technology versus a game or a play. It this is a picture where it shows that like 10, 10 15 years ago, uh, the mom had to like take us home to go for lunch or a dinner because we were all day outside playing football while uh, 10 years after it's uh, basically they're trying to kick us out because uh, now the kids has so many different options uh, tablets phones playstations all these other things and so something so digitalization of the world obviously brought uh, very good things for the society but it brought something negative for the football development uh culture so this is like a lifestyle like uh how much uh how much we can take uh how much we would like we are willing to take a risk so i would say croatia we are like really a risk takers so we we like to we like to uh we like to sometimes use more heart than a brain in when we are making a big decisions well, like if we compare ourselves to Scandinavians or like maybe Germans, they they prefer to be more uh, reasonable. So they will use their brain much more than a heart when they are making uh, big decisions. Again, now it's a question if this is good or bad, but for football, usually this is good because uh, a lot of kids are going to go and put all that they have in a football, even only 1% is going to make it. But if we have this big pool, obviously there will be a more, more, more players. And not only pool, but also pool of the ones that are going 100%. Uh, also importance of the football. This is Maslow hierarchy of needs. Sometimes like football is more important than like, uh, than like a safety or like a morality and stuff like that. Again, this is, I think, bad for the society, but it sometimes can be good for football. So when you see all of this, you can see that like Croatia, it's, usually, it's not like a perfect place to, uh, that's a big question. Is that maybe a good environment for creating professional football players? Because as, as Collins and McNamara say, the smooth sea never made a skillful sailor. So like same in the football, if everything is smooth, most likely that there won't be a football players. Uh, going, uh, sorry, David, do you see the top of the screen? Uh, or... Yeah, I see yes. the national level, yep. Yeah. yeah, okay, mm -hmm. perfect. So, okay, so on the mezzo level, as I mentioned, this is something that like, obviously we can influence it. And there is like, uh, there is uh, uh, some kind of prerequisites that are helping us in this. So for example, as I mentioned, the kids are not playing on the street as much as before, but they are still playing more than they do on like in USA, in uh, 
in France, in London, and so on. So that's a good thing. Uh, we have a big tradition of futsal. I'll talk about this, why this is good later. And also, in the maybe you know, like Croatia got out of socialism uh, in like the 90s, uh, like beginning of 20s. So like, but there is one positive thing that came out of that system. Uh, and that's that. Uh, that's the situation that like all the football pitches are free to use, so like kids can go outside and just play around, like they don't have to pay or anything like this. So this is something positive that came came out of that uh, X system. Uh, so getting to the conclusion about what I was saying now about this environment, if we separate like. Uh, societies in the in like a structured and non-structured or creativity comes from no structure for example i'll put we will put brazil over here they have creative uh, players uh, there is when you go there you see that country is not structured nothing is basically structured that was my experience uh, when we take example of country that's very structured in every every part or every level of influence and that's uh, for example germany where i lived they are you know uh, political system is very structured their companies are structured the way you drive bicycle around the city is very structured like you have to drive on the right side if you drive on the left side you get a ticket you know so this is like, you know, this 50% I was talking about. Now, when we talk about Croatia, usually we were, we were more to the non-structured side. But as we entered the European Union, we are developing as a nation. There is more possibilities, more education. You know, things are getting more and more structured, obviously. So we are at the moment, like, I would say we moved towards the middle, towards the equilibrium. And the... And the and what's going on and why we we have such a such a big production of the top players in the europe at uh, the moment with only 4 million people in croatia it's basically because i believe we are in the perfect equilibrium of structure and non structure that is necessary to to be uh, successful as a nation and on the club level as uh, in in football because if you're too structured you're going to have a perfect system, but when someone figures out your system, there is nothing you can do. While on the right side, if you are only non-structured, your players might be creative, they will be very skillful. But if they don't play as a team, 11 players together, they cannot follow the modern football anymore. So what you need is you need a mix of both. And I believe Croatia is at the moment in this equilibrium. And we need to make sure that it stays there. So... This is like a little analysis, what is going on. And now I'm uh, using this and knowing like this first 50% on the macro level that are influencing these kids. Now I'm creating the meso level and micro level, which are going to be obviously Taylor brand made yeah, for Croatia. So... First, uh, DNA. So DNA of the club is basically, club is old for 110 years and uh, uh, we have this like a saying against the powerful and no, like take from powerful and give to poor, we, which like it's kind of representing like this kind of like a Robin Hood, uh, Robin Hood kind of club, football club. Uh, so there is like a three pillars that are we are uh, creating the values in the club and that's a uh, heroism uh, friendship uh, friendship and honesty and these are all the words on croatian that we are trying to teach our kids to 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 <clears throat> to, uh, to develop the, develop these values so as i mentioned these three pillars create uh, DNA that creates the club. So when we are selecting a coach, we already have to select the person with these values. But when we are creating the player, 
we are basically selecting the player by his skills. And then later on, we are adding the values because these are kids six, seven years old when they enter our academy. And we are we we have a big influence on on their uh, on the values that they're gonna have as a human beings later on. So when I talk as general as possible, what the Hajduk split coach has to have in order to coach in our academy, he needs to believe in the development. He needs to believe that he can create out of the first guy on the pitch, he can create something or at least like maximize his uh, his potentials. So what he needs to teach the kids is basically how he needs to keep them between a comfort zone and the panic zone. So in this like a learning zone on the point of maximum maximum learning. Uh, so basically, this is like a skills and this is challenges. So the coach has to keep the player in this development flow so that if his skills are too high and the challenges are too low, he's going to be bored. While if his uh the if the challenges are too high and his skills are too low he's gonna be in the anxiety so he needs to make sure that his training everyday training training process keeps hopefully if that's possible every single kid in this zone so style of the game basically if we separate the styles on the position base or indirect and the direct style, which is transition based, uh, when our players comes to the first team, they need to know both of these systems. When we talk about the phase three, we go more on indirect or the position based football. And when we talk about phase two, it's even more possession based football and this phase one which is basically u8 to u12 this is all about possession based football because we want to have as many repetitions as many touches with the ball in order to to create a superior technical technical player b team is basically a bridge that's copying uh copying a first team football and creating a platform for the u19s to step up so when we talk about the style of the game, the A team or the first team has influence a lot on the B team. It has a little bit less influence on the pro sector. It has a even less influence on the mid sector and has almost no influence on the fun sector. While when we're creating a methodology, it's the same way. We start from below, from U8. There is no thinking about what we need in the first team. Like, no, no, sorry. There is no thinking about what kind of football we want to play in the first team, but it's about what the kids needs in order to create, uh, in order to maximize their potential in the technical and the tactical way. And in my opinion, this is something, this phase one, that should be universal all around the world. Yeah, like I believe no one should play play transition based football in uh, in this age groups because if you play transition based football, it's most likely that they won't touch the ball so many times, and we want that they are touching the ball. We want that they are uh, creating situation, uh, making a decisions, and that they uh, try to dribble and try to uh, tr uh, basically just trying, trying, trying a lot in order to get better. May I ask you uh, to uh, go further on transition-based football? Yeah. So you, what do so you mean? Uh, so let me, uh, how to say this? Uh, like transition-based football in a meaning like you try to get to the goal as fast as possible. And if that's possible with just one kick, long ball and like scoring, we do it. Like. I would say uh, uh, maybe something that Red Bull, you know, Leipzig was doing for, for, for some time at the beginning. Like if they can go directly to the goal, they will go directly yeah. to the goal. Okay. 
while I possession base would be something like Guardiola time of Barcelona. Yeah. Okay. Great. That's helpful. Yeah. Okay, so pro sector, basically we want to play dominant and creative football. We want to have a ball. We want to control the uh, possession in order to develop technical tactical abilities of the players. And we use positional uh, uh, game, uh, positional play as a base for the development of the style. Uh, we want a ball. Every moment is used for the to get the ball back in our possession. We want to intensive and aggressive uh, attitude and every player has to put uh, we in front of me. When we talk about the ball control, we we want a progressive, uh, progressive uh, possession. We want that every decision of the player in this age groups has a deeper meaning and that every pass or a dribbling has to create uh, advantage for the colleague on the pitch. So if you're going for a dribble, you're going with the reason to create maybe a chance to shoot or with the reason to create a uh, pass that's going to give your colleague a better situation than what you have at the moment. Same with the passing. Positional uh, play as a base. Uh, so basically every, every player on the pitch has to know uh, where they should be when, for example, right back has a ball. Yeah, but this starts from U16. Before that, we don't teach the kids, okay, if the right back has a ball, you should be here because we want to give them a freedom in this earlier age group. But from U16, they need to know where they're standing. So as we are closer to the, to the goal of the opponent, our, uh, sorry, as we are closer to our goal, our position is more uh, defined. While as we are close to the opponent goal, our position is more flexible. And this is going to make sense later. So basically, we have a four phases of the game, as you all guys have attacking phase, negative transition, uh, defensive phase, and the positive transition. And basically, at the moment, we don't have principles because we changed the coach in the first team. So we are still looking what we're going to do there. But we can skip this because it's less important. OK, now methodology. So let me. Let me show this. I think I have it in the English version. Just a moment. Just a moment, David. Sorry. No problem. <clears throat> but for some reason it's slow. Yes, better. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay. So, you see my screen? Yep. Uh, okay. So this is the this is the model. I think I was mentioning this before as well. Uh, so we are basically have a attacking. So this is a model that look uh, it looks from the individual player on the pitch. So basically, if you are a player on the pitch, there is only two situations for yourself at the moment. It's attack, which means your team has a ball, or there is a defense, which means your opponent team has a ball. So now 
there is a different situation, and that is if your team has a ball, your person who has the ball, what you can do with that ball, you can keep the ball for yourself or you can pass the ball either to your uh, teammate or you can pass the ball in the net, which would be like a scoring a goal. So this is only two things. If we look very general, what you can do when you have a ball in your feet. If your team has a ball, but you are not the player who has it, your, your colleague has it, what you can do is only two things. You can open for yourself or you can open for your teammate. And I'll explain what I mean here. When we talk about defense, basically you can be the person who is closest to the opponent who has a ball and you can try to take the ball away from him or you can try to intercept the pass of his or intercept the ball. Or you can be the person who is a third, a second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth away from a ball. And you can block the passing line or you can cover, cover your teammate who is trying to be outplayed by the, by the, by the opponent. So let me explain this in the details. So when we attacking, when my team is attacking and I have a ball in my feet, I can keep the ball for myself and then coach can work. This is like a maybe this is like a topic of the training. And then coach can work on receiving the ball, protecting the ball, dribbling the ball. Or if the topic of the training is a passing, you can work on short passing, long passing, or you can work on the different kind of shots on the goal. So this is a, this is a situation that I'm talking about. So for example, this is a game, 1v1. I'm the person who has the ball in my feet, the white player. What I can do, I can keep the ball for myself, and then I can work on the different things, dribbling this way, that way, outside, inside, Cruyff, Cruyff Maradona move, and so on. Or I can pass the ball, which means that situation has to be at least two versus one. Or if I'm playing one versus one, but then I'm passing the ball in the net, which would be a shot. Yeah. But if I'm working on the short pass or long pass, basically I need at least to have a situation 2v1. So when I'm when my team is attacking, but I'm not the person who has a ball. I can open for myself, I can open for a teammate, and then I can work on space, time, and positioning. Let me show you what I mean. So basically, we at least need to have a situation 2v1 or 2v2. So this is me, the player who don't have a ball. For So what I can do, I can open myself with intention to receive this ball. And then I can coach is working on it and coaching basically space where is opening time so timing when to do it and positioning so when i opened when i made a good timing how i position myself in order to receive that ball the best when i'm doing uh, when I, I can also open for my teammates so i'm opening i'm this player i'm opening to this space but not with the intention to receive this ball but with the intention to take this blue player away so that my colleague can dribble in the empty space. And then I can coach can work with this player on space, on timing, and on why, which is very important. It's like, why did you do that? Why that was a good move? Why you think you would give him advantage if he goes there? Okay. So in defense, as I mentioned, uh, if I'm the closest player to the opponent with the ball, I can work on taking the ball away from him and then coach can work on space, time and option how to do it, like a slide tackle, tackle that way or this way. Or if I'm playing one versus two, I can try to intercept the pass and then I work on space and time. If I'm not the closest player to the ball, I have two options. So I'm this player. I can block the passing line 
and then coach is working with me on space where to do that time and risk I, it's very important that the player understands the risk that he's taking by going here because he basically left this space alone yeah so he has to know the risk and then compare it with the time and space when he's going to do it and how he's going to do it covering basically if i'm this player and i see that my teammate is going to be maybe out out dribbled by the player with the ball i can come in this area and cover cover him up and again i need to know the risk that i'm leaving my player free so now all this that i mentioned we are doing through the different basically small sided games and this is like a, uh this is like uh uh games that we use or like a topics that topics that we use through these games and to develop it with the from the youngest kids to the oldest so in u8 and u9 so basically the main focus is on 1v1 2v1 as we move to u10 and u11 we move to 1v1 we stay with 1v1 2v1 we move to 2v2 2v3 and maybe 3v2 sometimes we start and so on. U12, U13, so it goes up to 3v3, 3v4, sometimes 4v4 or 4v3. And U14, U15 is going all the way up to the 4v4, maybe sometimes 5v5 and situations like this. As we reach the pro sector, all the games basically we are doing. So this is how the training looks like. There is a topic. We put a topic inside the games and then coach is creating the pre-games for that and he's creating the warm-up and at the end he's creating some kind of match where the kids play 6v6, 5v5, 8v8 or whatever def de depends which age group it is. But this is the topic and this should be the 30% of the training at least. So let me let's go through through one training. Uh, as I mentioned, this is our like a uh, theoretical structure. We want to keep the kids in the development flow. So let's say we train one v one play game, and today topic is keeping the ball and passing the ball. Yeah. So in keeping the ball, we can work on receiving, protecting, dribbling, and in passing the ball, I want to work on the shot. Yeah, there is no long pass, short pass, but shot. So let's say we have a situation where the guy with the ball, he lose five out of five games against this defender. So what's going to happen to him? He will be in anxiety. Why? Because his skills are too low for the challenges that coach put in front of him. So what coach can do for him, he can give him an easier opponent. He can put a larger space. Maybe there is a problem with technique or he push him out to work on the isolated technique. If the kid is bored, which would mean that he wins five out of five games against this guy, you can give him harder opponent you can give him smaller space or you can put the game 1v2. If he is or even is still better than others, he should go to the age up category. So this is situation I was mentioning uh, earlier. Sorry, I'm going to get back to my... Sorry. I'm gonna get to my previous presentation. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so maybe you remember when my first slide was about this categorization. So like top talents were blue, uh, talents were green, first team players were like yellow, and then these reserves were like orange. So basically, let's say this is like a, just some kind of, can be a warm-up game or a pre-game, but coach is putting the best guy in the team 
playing against the second best guy in the team. So this way, he makes sure that both of them are in the development flow because maybe this game is going to end up 3-2. So the both of them are neither in anxiety, neither in the boredom. Third and the fourth play against each other, five and six play against each other, seven and eight play against each other. Why is this very important? Because maybe number eight at the moment has a huge potential, but he's a kid who is biologically smaller. He started training football later. So like maybe he's going to move up from uh, position eight to position four in next five to six months. But if you put him now to play eight versus two, he's going to lose five games and he's just going to give up on soccer, football. So it's very important to keep the kids in the development flow. And then we're going to see later on what is their actually uh, level of potential. Okay. Uh, so starting fund sector, U8 to U11, phase one. Uh, demands. We want to create as many triangle game structures. We want to develop static and dynamic technique. We want to develop individuality and we want to develop creativity. So style of the game, we want to create a situation in the match that uh, that's uh, embracing like 1v1 and the 2v1 situations. Defense, we want to be aggressive to return the ball back in our possession and possession is more important than a win in this age group. As the kids has a problem with this, what we were mentioning, like playing on the streets, uh, in the parks and so on. We also have at least 30 minutes per week. This like a motor skill, uh, different sports and the stuff in order to, to add up on what is missing in this new generations. So U8, U9. Uh, now you remember the model, sorry, this is on creation, but I think you already understand what is each. You see that in U8 and U9, we don't have this sector and we are missing this sector, which is opening for a teammate. Why? Because opening for a teammate concept is very hard to understand for the kids that are seven and eight years old. So what we work on is only when the kid has a ball in his feet or when he's the first player to the opponent who has a ball. Also, without the ball, we only work on open for yourself. So these are the games. As I mentioned, so basically U8 and U9s, we work on 1v1, 1v2, 2v1, and this is how the training looks like. So this is a warm up. Uh, just a usual warm up where they dribbling the ball, trying to find the empty space. Then this is like a first pre-game where they play 1v1. Basically, each kid has a ball and trying to take the ball away from the other kid. Kick it out, yeah? Last one standing wins. And coach is obviously not saying as much here. He's just giving them a freedom. This is the youngest age group. Up, oh, sorry. We return okay here and then they go to the sprints. Yeah, it's preparation for something that's waiting for them in the game 1v1. And then this is like the part that I was mentioning, the main part, the topic of the training. So basically the coach coach topic uh, of the training was basically the keeping the ball keeping the ball and then dribbling the ball out uh, he's focusing on the yellow team at the moment because that's the team who is in the attacking phase of the game so the game starts and basically he's just the kid is trying to dribbling and then coach can tell him a few things but not as much because dribbling is about also the individuality and creativity and so on The orange kid, basically, if he takes the ball, he just go on the right or left to, to score the goal. But the focus is not on them. I'll just let it be so you see how this looks like. Obviously, they are not always successful, but yeah. Coach is trying to, to match 
the quality of the players. Okay, this is now the B part. Now they play 1v1 basically without stopping. So it's a very hard, it's intensive for the kids. And there is now no more like running out left and right when you take the ball, but you have to go straight on. Yeah. They immediately he starts trying to get on the other side where is the goal and then the game is game is rolling and this is 30 percent of the training yeah yeah here the coach adds like one guy who can help them so it's kind of one v one plus one he cannot dribble or anything so he can just be used as like a wall pass player and then they finish basically with a match 4v4 plus the goalkeepers. On the small pitch. Okay, I can skip this part. So what is what is important is to try to create some kind of game where the kids have this like a dribbling situations one v one maximum two v one in this age group. Okay, and then we go to U ten and U eleven. Now we add, we add, uh, we add covering of the teammate. Why covering? Because in U10 and U11, we start to have 2v2 situations. So in 2v2 situations, you basically can decide to cover up your teammate. So they have to start learning like defensively the relation of the two players between each other. So this is a training of the U9s. So there is like, there is a it's a warm-up we skipped basically I, di I didn't film it we already had some kind of uh, examples of that this is like a pre-game where where they're doing just like a isolated dribbling so they are dribbling uh, the cones and after that there is a pass And then it, there is just like a different versions of all of this. And then we start first game 2v1. So two blue guys has to go over these two blue cones without orange player being able to take a ball away from them. So blue player always has an option to dribble or to pass the ball to the another blue guy. And this is what the coach is coaching. No, that was a mistake. So there is another orange guy comes in. Yeah, they outplay him and they start again from on the other side. Yeah, again, you can see that orange, orange guy is um, 
not doing well positioning and stuff, but coach is not coaching this. So he's letting them just do whatever they want in the defense. What is the focus of the training is attacking part of these two blue guys. Oh, sorry. Oh, okay, now he has two options. This time he chose dribbling. Oh, not successful. Start again. Start again, start again, start again. And now we go to the B version. So it's a game 2v1. This time yellow player makes a shot and then he comes to play defense against two guys. Yeah, two red against one yellow, option to dribble or option to pass. Very good dribbling with a fake pass and then start the next group. Yeah, two v one again, option to dribble, option to pass. This time he pass and this is what the coach is coaching, like a time, how good is the short pass timing of the pass and so on not successful I'm just going to let it be so you see the concept. Yeah, very good dribbling. Good fake. from different angle and the last one okay and now again at the end they play a match 4v4, this is the most usual one in these age groups. 4v4 plus goalkeepers. So the coach, again, in this game, he can coach, but he should not coach the situations 4v4. He should coach the situations like 2v1 that's creating on the pitch because this was his topic. So something like this. Yeah, he can pass. No, he went for a dribbling. So what he was coaching. Okay, I'm gonna, just going to let it be so you see how it's going. Yeah, goalkeeper, very good pass. Mistake. Yeah, here is again 2v1 situation, dribbling 2v1 against with the goalkeeper, not a good pass, goalkeeper stops the situation. 
Okay. I think you got an idea, David. Is there any questions about this part? Yep. Um, questions. If you have questions, pop them in the Q and A. I don't see any questions in the Q and A right now. But there, we uh, there was one um, somebody sent me. We uh, a little bit of communication. Um, the the games you showed that you do the numbers um, up till under 15, you don't go above 4v4 for your um, training games. Yeah, this is for this part that I was mentioning. It's like 30% of the, of the training. Yes. Obviously, sometimes we do like 5v5 maybe of course. with the U15s, but Usually in this 30% of the training, no. This should be like a still, like a, it should be like a group tactics. Like, a, so four players in relation, not more than that. Because we want to repeat these situations as many times as possible. But obviously, last 20 minutes of the training, they play maybe yeah. even 11 v 11. But that's not the that's not the time where the coach is focusing on coaching on fixing the things and so on. Yeah. So this is to in order to ensure enough repetition of those moments. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Good. That's what we. Uh, yeah. Okay. I can move on. Yes. Yep. Oh, perfect. So this is uh, with these kids from U8 to U11, we train six times, uh, six weeks, and then seventh week is, uh, is uh, off. So this is one week, Monday to Sunday. Monday we have training, Tuesday we have training, Wednesday we have free, Thursday we have uh, free games or deliberate plays on the, our, around the city, Friday training, Saturday game, Sunday free. So what is the free games free games are basically in some kind of park pitches and so on and this is where we basically the kids are creating the training by themselves the coaches just bring the ball so usually they create some kind of games like this like they're hitting the wall with a one touch and then whoever miss he lo he's losing the points or they uh, do you guys hear me Yes. 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 Hello. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so they, there is a goalkeeper and they play two v two, for example, here, or there is a goalkeeper. They play one v one here and they try to score score the goal. Yeah. Situation something like this and basically they just repeating. They are joking. They are having fun. They try things that usually they won't try in the training because. In the training, if you make a mistake, coach, like, uh, he tells you where is the mistake. He wants you to change it, not to fix it and so on. Uh, but here they can do, they can do situations like maybe there is a player open and you go one, we two, and you try to dribble them out and the goalkeeper. This is not like as it should be, but they can take risks and they can try. Because this way, we believe that they are creating, a, first they are getting, they are being creative because they are free to think and to try whatever they want. And the second thing, they are getting their dribbling skills. This is another game, another game. Yeah, trying to chip the ball over the goalkeeper and so on. So this is how the training looks like. <laughs> Goalkeeper throws the ball, and then they play. Here they play 2v2 plus one neutral. Yeah, he throws the ball behind his back, and then they play. They're just free to do whatever they want. Here, these four guys, they create a game where they pass to each other. They have to pass in the square. And these three guys are hitting the ball off the wall, and they have only one touch. So it's a very, like, a free... Like it's a kind of replicating the games that we had as a kids on the streets. In the winter, we play futsal 
when we cannot be outside. So that one training is in the futsal courts. I thought, I think I spoke about this. Why I want to create futsal is because usually our leagues are five plus goalkeeper or six plus goalkeeper. So it's one more player here. And I think this is not good for the development of these kids because we want to have situation 1v1. We want to have dribbling and creativity situation. So if we have a players in the middle, it's creating plus actually like a positional play that's in this situation it's very hard for him to dribble in the middle so he has only option to dribble on the on the flank which is not good because you need to always have two options in order to make a dribbling uh dribbling good so what's going on it's also hard to pass but you only have one option to pass it's down the flank so i believe we should change this to play as much as we can with the kids in a situation like 4v4 because there is always two options to dribble and the next player would always have again situation 1v1 and two options to dribble. When it's about passing, it's also about the creating a free space. So when you have four players on the pitch, there is always like a empty space on the pitch that if the player is recognized in this space without being coached, we can say that he's a he has a, some kind of potential. Sorry. Uh, Take this off. I think you guys hear me, right? Yeah. And then yeah. we move yeah. on. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so we create this futsal tournaments, and basically it looks like this. So now you're gonna see like in this 10 15 seconds how many times our kids had like a situation to dribble or 1v1 and how many times they had to make like a quick decision and how how faster the game it was actually yeah number nine up one dribbling yeah here one dribbling two dribblings good tackle pass again pass again good pass in the deep shot oh Post. so like so many things happened so many every basically player touched the ball in the 15 seconds and so, these two guys actually touched even more and they at least had one or two dribblings and that's what what we want in this age groups i'll i'll put this one more time just to take a look without me being talking Okay, so why is this also important for us is because in this age groups, if we play six plus one, five plus one, you know, when you play these smaller teams, usually they have one or two players that are good. So if you play six v six, usually we, we, you know, kick their ass, you know, it's like six zero at the end. But if we play four v four and they have two good players, you know, they can compete against us. For example, this red team, I think the game finished 0-0, even we were dominant, and they won on the penalties. So the kids from these uh, areas, they still are very motivated to train because they are um, they are successful. They don't lose against Hajduk split 6-0. So why are we doing this is because this 5 plus 1 situation and these players, the center backs, the defensive mids, maybe central mids, these are the players that we're going to get later on. These are the players of the system. Yeah, the center backs, okay, strong, has to be good in the air, fast. But th their, their, their positions are very binary. They don't need amazing decision making. They just need to be knowing like how to take, uh, what, how, to, uh, how good risk takers they are. And uh, also defensive mid is the guy who like, needs to know how to control the tempo, but it ha doesn't have to be like an amazing dribbler or a 1v1 player, or it doesn't have to be as creative as these guys up top. So what do we want to find? We want to find kids before 11 years old who hold the potential, the forward position, 
positions. They have to be creative, very good dribblers, very good skills. And this is what we are developing until 11 or 12 years old. So this kind of situation, this kind of situation of 4v4, and we basically want to develop the players who are going to be very good in this last third of the game in the on the professional level. And we have to find them by 11, 12 years old. I will pull out some science works that prove this, what I'm saying, and not only prove, but I was putting this methodology by some scientific research. So in last two European and World Cup, members found, Kemp and members found that teams that had more creative moves before three moves, three uh, actions before scoring the goals they had uh, they uh, they were reaching the same team in the world today can bring the ball to last third last 30 meters of the goal but what it makes difference against the teams that are defending really good it it makes a difference of a creative move by some individual and this is we need to know how to develop creativity in the kids uh, foot, little footballers. So Memert, because he he's doing on this topic a lot of research, he found out that players that were uh, characterized as highly creative, they spent two more, they spent they spent two more hours, two, uh, two times more hours in the free, uh, in the deliberate play or in the free game until they're 14 years old, which is unstructured place, like a playing on the street without coach, without anyone. And this is very good proof that we need this, some, uh, this kind of environment to find these extraordinary, highly creative players. So now I mentioned to you that we have a problem in the society, is that kids don't play on the street anymore. So how we're going to tackle the problem is I showed you some of the examples in how we train in academy. Also, another thing is like a YouTube channel and uh, we have about 100 clips where the kids can take a look of the YouTube. Uh, uh, take a, go on the YouTube because all of them has a phone today. And they can just uh, basically uh, go outside on the street and we are motivating them to, 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 to just play with the friends and so on. So this is a trailer for it. So it says, in order to become a football player of Hydro Split, you need to go through these steps. Uh, like a street football, academy, and then stadium. Okay, U12 to U15. Now we don't want to only create the triangles, we want to create the diamond structures of the game. And we are formalizing the system into 1 4 3 3. Style remains the same and everything remains the same. So this is the formation that we play with the all categories from U12 to U15. What it's changing, it's these three positions up top. So I mentioned to you like these three guys up top are usually someone who is creative, who is different, who is doing something out of, out of the box. So if we have in generation, let's say 2008 born, a very good playmaker, we're going to play like this, or we have two power forwards. But if we have very good target man, so we can see that kids is going to be a target man, he plays very good he feels very good when he plays uh, with the goal uh, with with back against the goal uh, or he's uh, uh, very well then we're going to adapt the formation to to him why because again these are the special guys 
when we work with these kids, U12 to U15, it's very important that we motivate them by the hope of winning rather than the fear of loss. So we are, instead of punishing them, we are giving them like uh, achievement praises. So this is the win cup ranking. Basically, every time we play, you know, I was telling you about the games and at the end, after the games, there is like a match. And when we play the match and at the end of the training, like these kids played 4v4, in U12 to U15, every time someone wins or someone loses, we are putting that in the ranking like a league. And coach is putting this on Monday in the locker room or he's sending in the WhatsApp. And then everyone can see on which position they are. So this way, the guys who are last, they are trying to get away from there. And the guys who are first, they have this like a pressure of keeping themselves being first. So it's something like when they come to the professional football, they're going to have situations where their team is first, but it's a huge pressure to stay first. And this is something they have to know how to handle it. And if we start doing it with these little things, you know, we're going to be preparing them for the, for the future. Why we do this? Because the good coach doesn't have to show a need to win. But his players must. So I don't want to see a coach who is screaming on the sideline. I want to see players that are giving 100%. And then I know that coach did a good job during the week. So U12, U13. Now we have full concept. Everything is included in the topics. Why? Because we start playing all the way three to 3v4, three even 4v4, 4v3 sometimes. So team tactics, 15%. Group tactics, 2-3 player in relation, 35% of the training. And individual tactic, 50% uh, of the training. As we move up, the group tactics and team tactics are getting, is taking more and more of a pie. So this is the situation again. And this is just an example. Again, the coach of U13, they play 4v4 with the goalkeepers, but at the end of the of training, but he's giving a feedback in relation of, uh, I think his training here was like 3v2. Yeah. So these two guys plus this guy, or maybe one, two, three guys. Yeah, he's telling him to stay wide. This guy's dribbling, okay, he's getting wide, getting wide. The guy has a space in the middle. What is interesting is, as I mentioned to you, like we need top talents and talents to play against each other. So these eight guys here, the coach is coaching them, head coach, and this is the best eight guys he has in the team. While the guy is on the right side, there is a seven of them. This is the rest of the seven, rest of the seven that that they have okay i think you got a got an idea u14 u15 full concept but now 2v1 2v2 all the way to 4v4 and 5v5 we introduce as well as a positional game Team tactic, 25%, group tactic, 50%, uh, and individual tactic, 25% in the U15s. After that, it's starting to be all about group and team tactics mostly in the, in the pro sector. So about pro sector, I won't talk as much because here we need to have a principles where we adding on the team, team tactics that we want to develop for the first team. At the moment, we are changing this regularly as we change the coaches in the first team but what is important in in it's very universal i think for everyone uh development before it was all about like keeping the ball uh, technical tactical stuff and so on but now the win is becoming a part of development we need to learn how to win the match sometimes it can be ugly as well but it's about winning now so we have a process where we video tag the game and every player gets like his tagging uh, analysis. So how many times he passed good, how many times he dribbled good and so on. And then there is a video feedback. We are giving three to four times a video feedback in individual 
individual or a group uh, way. After that, we go to training and we do it two to four times a month, basically every second week. And when? Before training, inside the training, after the training on the recovery day. How? In the group or individual situation. So this is the example of midfielders. I believe here they're working on coaches telling them like direction right or left in the last second and then they go and after that they shoot. Goalkeepers work on the longer pass. Here a little bit of isolated technique. I believe these are the wingers and the fullbacks and the center backs work on their heading skills and jumping skills. Uh, and then they go to do more in the group way, long ball, center backs. Yeah. Okay. And so on. So, uh, David. Yep. I believe we crossed already like <laughs> more than an hour. So I would uh, I would stop myself on this because after this it's only about periodization and about the coaching development and so on. Uh, I believe I don't know if you agree, but I think this was uh, like uh, enough enough for today. And if the people has the questions, I think we can we can focus more on the details about what I was preaching now. Great, um, back on. Yeah, uh, so questions in the Q and A. Um, no, quite, there was one question in the in the chat. Um, there's a few people in the. If you do have questions, put please put them in the Q and A versus the chat. Just it's a little bit easier for us to monitor them. Um, Here's question. one. Go ahead, Benjamin. Oh, well, just what are your thoughts of training boys and girls together under twelve? Uh, sorry. What are uh, your what thoughts are you of, of training boys and, boys and girls together yeah. after the club? Yeah, uh, you know, in our club, obviously, we don't have this because we are like a professional academy. Uh, but uh, when I was working in USA, when I see these other like uh, academies around the city, I don't, I don't, I don't see a problem at all. So I have nothing against, for sure. I, I have a question. Um, okay. The um, yep. Croatian uh, developing creative players, um, your observations when you were here for three years, um, what would you recommend we do uh, in order to, um, or, and do you think our issue is creativity or is it lack of structure in reading the game or is it a combination of all of it? And what would you recommend? Well, you know, what, what, I, what I could see is like a clear difference between the kids for with like a Latino descendants and who are living in like poorer areas because I think they have this like a playing in front of schools and the stuff a lot. I wasn't there as much, but I could see clear difference. Yeah. Uh, comparing to the kids that are coming from the like a rich areas yep. that their whole day is structured already like mom takes to home then mom takes to piano and then mom takes to soccer so it's like it's very very different yeah like you could see then like on the soccer pitch they are very like you know they want to win they are they are dedicated for winning and stuff but like these skills this like creativity to do something out of ordinary it, it lacks what I would say on the very general global level is just like implement futsal. Like just as many of these leagues and even I would say in U8 and maybe U7, I would implement this like Funinho, that uh, Spanish, uh, Sp uh, Spanish FA has this tra tradition. It's basically playing 3v3 
be with like uh, four goals or like two goals, two goals, and just like let them like repeat. And uh, it's also about, I think, um, educating the coaches that in this age groups, we need to create environment for the kids. Not necessarily we need to give them so many informations. It's just like environment in which it's how you structure your training in order that they are free to try many things. Yeah. And then also, I think one very, very important thing, what I realized, and I saw it in the Germany, because, you know, Germans, when they see the problem, they fix it really quickly. Uh, they, they removed like a referees in the leagues before 12 years, before 11 years old. And I like this a lot because I recognize, you know, kids are learning by watching and they watch TV and watch Cristiano Ronaldo and all these guys. So like, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, when he dribbles, especially now in the older days, when he dribbles out one guy, if the guy touch him at least a little bit, he just falls down and trying to get a free kick because it's a good position for him to score. Uh, we need the kids who wants to dribble the one guy and second guy and the third guy not that they are like if if they are touched they just fall down but they are learning this from watching the game on the tv yeah. so what what is interesting is when there is no referee we tried one tournament to do it without referee and then like you know one once or twice the kids you know when they fall down they take a look around there is no referee so they have no one to ask for a foul so after one or two times, they just don't fall anymore if they are really not like a kicked, then they fall down. So then you get much more situations where, where they dribble. And yeah. where they, when they dribble, they try to get on yeah. the other guy. And then you have this like environment where, where they don't stop. Okay. All right. I and obviously, enough. if the coach is not coaching, the side it's it's even better because yeah. then the kid can process his thoughts much much, much better okay i uh, i went and watched four different clubs this weekend and i watched one hispanic club and to me it was the most interesting to watch the others were probably more organized football they knew what they were going to do but there was no special very few special players especially um, on the female side. In fact, the one or two that were had something special were Hispanic. Um, and one actually there was one that was a you could just tell she loved to dribble. Uh, but it, it for me was also lacking. I have a question. Um, do you think uh, or uh, first yes. I'll give you an opinion and see if you agree. In our country, we have a lot of children at first they like to dribble more. They're more so individual. They're more creative. Um, and in our country, we start with a lot of exercises that encourage that, um, but we don't stay with it long enough. Is that why with the 15s and below, you do so many small-sided games to make sure that these moments are trained again and again and again, and you have to stick with it long enough that it becomes part of their DNA? Is that correct? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's absolutely like this, and it's... You know, it's also, it's about defining the problem. And, uh, you know, guys like me, I'm a young guy, 30 years old, and I watch all these YouTube videos and analysis and so on. And then, you know, we are learning in today's world, you can learn from Guardiola, watch his trainings and yeah. stuff. But then we get like a U19. And we want to do the same thing with the new U19 or U13, doesn't matter. And what happens, we started teaching team tactics so yeah. early. and I believe, and this is my experience, uh, we have a time for the team tactics. Yeah. This is something that kids can learn from U16 to U19. Three years are more than enough. But if they don't learn the dynamics of situation, 1v1, 2v1, 3v2, and they repeat so many times, so they, fe they feel like uh, extremely conf confident in this situation to the point that this is unconscious move. Yeah then we get like a top players who can make a situation one we one like a smooth and their their uh, heartbeat won't get up on 180 when they're in situation one we one but they're going to be loose off 
Yeah. So later on, then you can add everything on that. And that's why I said, like, I believe football game is going to become like a futsal game just on the different parts of the pitch. Yeah. So we just need to play 3v3, 4v4 leagues in this age groups before 12s, for sure. You, I have a question with that. Is it leagues? Um, here we have a big push to make the games smaller, but most of the players' time is spent in trainings. So I think the games, uh, and we had a, somebody that presented from Holland two weeks ago, and he, the games, he said, uh, they go a little bit bigger numbers, but for him, it's the trainings. And for me, I think the games, it's one day a week, maybe two, but the trainings are three or four. Yeah. So it's the training. I mean, do you think it's necessary no, to go? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so in the trainings itself, you can but, keep but it small. You, you know, you know what is about, you know what is about the games. It's like, you know, me and you, Benjamin and David, we are yeah. thinking about football eight hours a day. But if we want to change the general concept, the, you know, the every coach is preparing for a game. Yeah. So like. Uh, I had, a, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a situation where like with the U8 and U9s and me, maybe U10s, I want to change the ball size to number three. Okay. We didn't have this before here, but I saw it in like, for example, in Brazil. And which completely makes sense. We have a kids who are U13, they play with the yeah. ball four and U8 play with the ball four. And the size of their, of, of their foot is this and this. Yeah. It's not the same. So we wanted to change this. And then, but the league didn't want to change at the moment. So they play on the weekend with number four. And I'm asking them to train with number three. Yeah. And obviously coaches immediately, but my kids are going to be worse at the game at the, at the weekend. So yeah. if they play a game at the weekend six v six, he's going to at least on Friday train six v six at least. So yeah. we are losing that day. Or part you know, of it, if yeah. we want to general general concept, then we have to change the game, I believe, especially in the USA, where you have a lot of this, like a parents coach in these age groups down below. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. That's my opinion. Hey, I'm very sorry, but I need to get to another meeting. I'm already late. Uh, Andro, this has been very good. I'm going to send out, I think everyone should go back and rewatch all of your um, the lectures you've done for us. I'm incredibly grateful. I know it's late there for you right now. You probably should be with your wife or your girlfriend or, <laughs> or partner. Um, but I, I cannot express how special it is that you take this time to, to share this information with us. Um, I think uh, Croatia is an example for world football. For me, it's a blend between Europe and South America. You're the Brazilians of Europe and you have something that I would encourage people having been there. I would encourage people, if you can, go see the society, sports everywhere, uh, watch the football and the people are wonderful. It's a, it's a great culture and um, we're incredibly thankful that you've taken this time. So thank you very much. And I'm going to come and visit it, you. It was my, it was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. And uh, everyone who is listening here, you know, that you your door is open to come to Heidi Split, take out the, take, take a look of the trainings and whatever you need. Looking at, looking at the chat, it looks like there's a few people that make. Okay, yeah, I'm going to go, David. Uh, thank you again, cool. Andrew. Thank you. So, um, yeah, just, just for everyone, um, we will okay. send, See you, Benjamin. we will send out a recording again, a huge, huge thank you to Andrew, who's um, now done three of these. We really hope that Next year we can get you out here on the grass and in, in real life um, when, when this is over because um, I think that there's there's so many good messages in that so uh, thanks once again uh, again we will send out a recording of the webinar there's a, I, I certainly want to go back and watch it again um, there's a lot in there uh, but a big thank you again and um, thanks to everyone for joining uh, we'll see you I think we have I think we're back on again next week uh, we have U.S. Soccer, someone from um, Antal Vergier, the uh, Director of Methodology for U.S. Soccer, um, whose who's background is from Holland. He's going to be presenting, and we look forward to that one. But a big thank you again. Lots of thank yous coming in in the chat. So, Andrew, much of, Andrew, sorry, much appreciated. And I uh, get to bed. <laughs> it, was, it was my pleasure. It was my pleasure. Okay, thank you, David. Thank you so Bye. much. Thanks. Bye. Thanks again.